morning, everybody. Hey, our services are going to kick off here in just a couple minutes. But while we still have some time, we want you guys to check out the digital bulletin in which we've got some great worship songs for you guys to worship together with before the service begins. We're going to head on out, but we'll be back in just a couple minutes. Stay tuned. Hey, we're gonna get started in just a couple of minutes, but I wanted to remind you about life groups. They're happening on Wednesdays at 6.15. I hope that you can check in. We're gonna talk about Ken's message that he talks about today. The service will start in just a few minutes.
Hey students, if you haven't been joining us for Midweek Live or Sunday Morning Live, what are you waiting on? Check out our student ministry newsletter for more information as well as our Instagram page for all the information to get plugged in with us during the week. Our services will be starting in just a moment, but if you'll excuse me, I'm going to get back to my quarantine snacks. Hey, good morning, church family. Hey, our services will be starting in just a couple of minutes, but don't forget, check out our KGBC Family Ministry page on Facebook. Uh, we're trying to keep that updated, posting some fun, exciting stuff for your families to do throughout the week. So stay tuned to the service in just a few more minutes.
Good morning. Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made, so we're going to rejoice and we're going to be glad in it. Amen. Hey, we're so glad that you're here this morning. We pray that you and your families are well. We pray that you're experiencing God's faithfulness during these days. And we're so glad that you decided to connect with us this morning. Hey, if you're a first time guest, welcome. We would love the opportunity to get to know you a little bit. And so we're going to encourage you, if you wouldn't mind, send the word welcome to the number that you see on your screen below. And we love the chance to get to correspond with you via text message just a little bit to get to know who you are. Kings Grant family, you know the drill on our connect card. You know that that's just a great tool that we use to connect with one another. So we're going to encourage you to go to that digital bulletin, click the link to our connect card, fill it out, let us know how you're doing, and let us know how we can be praying for you. One other thing that we want to remind you about is you can share this service. You can click the share button right now and it'll go to your social media pages, or you can text the link to somebody who may need to hop on right now and view our services. So lots of ways that you can share and encourage others and still invite people to church during this time. Mm -hmm. And not only can people share this event, but they can actually, you can actually serve during this time of social distancing. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to uh, emphasize the, the way that you can serve other people. Uh, we have our give help and get help form. And uh, we have people that are ready, able, and willing to, to try to meet the need, whatever need you may have. And so we have folks that have uh, bought groceries or picked up prescriptions or have done some yard work or cleaned out gutters. If you have a need, you could let us know about that. And we have people that are ready and willing to do that, to try to meet that need. And so we can still be the hands and feet of Jesus uh, during this time. We also mentioned uh, last week about our month, our partnership with uh, Samaritan House this month. Uh, we sent $2,000 this past week as a church, uh, but the, the benevolent offering for this month is also going to go toward the Samaritan House. We talk about uh, being uh, sheltering in place and how safe that does sound. But with Samaritan House, we were made aware that sometimes home is not the safest place to be. And so there are abusive situations where people need to get out of the house. And so Samaritan House needs more space yeah. because they don't have enough space to put people in their Samaritan House. But we can put them into a hotel room for $450 a week. And so as a church, we wanted to provide a benevolent offering to help meet that need. So you can give directly to Samaritan House or you can send money to the church and that will go toward our benevolent offering. And all this month, monies that come in for benevolence will go toward the Samaritan house. So those are two great things, you know, serve others as you can. And then we're going to emphasize the Samaritan house this month. But it seems to me, I saw something on social media about a new partnership. So you know something about that. Yes. So even though we've kind of been shut down business-wise a little bit, there are still some really exciting things happening. Our missions committee and our finance committee have gotten together and declared a new partnership for the next two years. And we're so excited to announce it to you this morning. It actually is a uh, a partnership with someone that you may know. And so we actually are announcing this morning that we are going to be partnering with Julia Wallace for the next two years as she is going to be serving on mission in Lebanon. And so earlier this week, I was able to get on a Zoom call with Julia and talk about uh, what God is leading her to do and how we as a church can be supporting her and praying for her during this time. And so I want you to check out this Zoom call. And then right after that, we are going to be led in worship as we prepare for communion. So check this video out. Hey, Julia. Hey, Beth. It's so good to see you. Hey, for those who don't know you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your connection to King's Grant? Yes, absolutely. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Julia Wallace, although I know many of you do know me. I was a member of King's Grant from 2004 until 2012 when I moved to Texas, Waco, Texas, to attend Baylor University. Uh, but you may also be familiar with my family. My dad was associate pastor and then head pastor from 2004 until 2016. So uh, King's Grant is definitely a home for me and my family, and I'm just glad to be connected again. So we hear that congratulations are in order. You just graduated with your uh, master's, actually two masters. So tell us a little bit about um, your degrees and what about your plans for uh, after graduation? Yes, absolutely. So. As you can imagine, this is very unconventional last semester of school with the pandemic going on. 
but I uh, just finished my master's of divinity and master's of social work. Um, after finishing at Baylor, I felt called to stay here and continue my education. And so I've been in Waco. Uh, I stayed in Waco four more years after I graduated. And I just submitted my last assignment two days ago. So in a week or so, I'll have my diploma and officially be a graduate, uh, a master's graduate. So my plans after this, as many of you may know, is that I will be moving overseas to Lebanon to work for a, a faith-based nonprofit. That is so cool. Well, congratulations. Well, how did you get uh, find out about Lebanon? How were you led mm. to go there? It's a crazy story, and I'm sure we don't have enough time for all of it. But um, about 10 years ago, actually in the sanctuary of King's Grant, I first sent my call to international ministry. And since then, through different experiences and, and connections with people, God has really refined that down to the Middle East. Uh, so towards the end of my undergraduate degree, I kind of sensed that call to the Middle East. And just through various connections here with my church in Texas and then Virginia Baptist, I got connected to Lebanon. Um, and so four years ago, summer of 2016, I actually went to Lebanon to attend a conference there with the Lebanese Baptists. And little did I know that that conference and that organization is the one I am going to now be working for. So Virginia Baptist developed a partnership with them in the past few years as part of their Focus Refugee Initiative. And so I found out about that and we got connected again. And so, yeah, so I'll be going to work uh, on behalf of Virginia Baptist, but I'll be working with uh, the Lebanese Society for Educational and Social Development. That is so awesome. So what are you most excited about as you prepare to go abroad? Oh, so many things. Um, I think just the fact that this is, uh, what God has called me to and has been preparing me for for so long. Again, it's been over a decade where I first sensed this call to international ministry. And so I'm just very excited to see what God has been preparing me for in this. Um, I'm also just excited to work with the organization, the LSESD. They are one of the most incredible organizations I've ever seen. They do a variety of things. They do relief, community development, education, trauma support, um, just you name it. They, they have a very holistic vision of what they're doing and how to serve people. So I'm just excited to be part of the work that's already being done uh, to serve and love people. Um, and then through that, you know, people come, have come to know Christ because of the faithfulness of this organization. So I'm just very excited to be a part of that. Um, and also I'm just excited for the partnerships. So I know it's easy to think that this is just my ministry, what God has called me to, but that's not the case whatsoever. I couldn't do this without the support, uh, the financial support of other people, without prayer and encouragement. Uh, and so I'm just excited about the way uh, that this might transform me, but also hopefully the way this experience transforms you all as you are part of this mission with me. It all sounds so incredible. And I know that um, you are, having some questions as to when you're able to leave right now because of this pandemic. So how is this going to affect one, your departure date, but also your ministry in Lebanon? Mm -hmm. Yes. So my original departure date was June 10th. Uh, that most likely will be postponed. It just depends on travel bans currently um, and international flights. And so uh, worst case scenario, I think I may be postponed until July or August this year. Uh, but again, my goal is to get there as soon as possible because I have a job waiting for me and an apartment waiting for me. And so it really is just a matter of when I'm allowed to travel and can do so safely. Um, and as far, as far as the work, um, that's a big prayer request I actually have for you all. It's just praying for, for refugees and God's particular protection for them. They are very, very vulnerable in this type of situation, this pandemic. Um, they don't have, they aren't able to self-isolate if anyone gets infected because they live in very close quarters. They don't have good access to personal hygiene. They also don't have really any access to, to medical care. So just please pray that God protects them especially. Um, I think there is a first case of uh, a refugee having one in Lebanon that was disclosed a few days ago. And so just prayers that that can be contained and that people can be safe. Um, and I'm not sure how that will impact the ministry, but I'll find out in a couple months when I get over there. Wow. We will definitely pray for that. And I just wanted to know how else can we be praying for you as you're preparing to leave, but also how can we be praying for you for the next two years as you are in Lebanon? Yeah. Thanks. There's lots of different ways. Um, I think just first of all, prayers for a smooth transition, uh, to a different country. That's obviously a big thing. 
Um, thankfully, growing up as a missionary kid, I have some kind of experience and moving to Texas, big culture shock. <laughs> so, um, but just prayers for a smooth transition. Um, also that I can um, find a strong community there, specifically a faith community and good friendships. Uh, I know a few people in the country, but not really. So just prayers for, for community and relationships. Um, and then also, I'd really appreciate prayers for just emotional stamina. I'm very aware that this is going to be a, a difficult, difficult thing. I mean, it's going to be exciting to see how God's working, but it is still a very hard situation. Um, there's going to be lots of trauma, lots of heartache, lots of grief in the work, I'm sure. So just prayers for uh, God's strength through that. Um, and then finally, just prayers for the refugees themselves and also the ministry uh, and all of the workers who have dedicated their entire life to this. So just prayers for, for that uh, and for all of those people as well as they continue this work uh, to serve and love others and care for them um, and just to be Christ's light in the world. Absolutely. Well, Julia, we are so excited to be partnering with you for the next two years. Uh, we are thankful to our church family for uh, rallying around this partnership. And we're so excited to see uh, what God does um, through your ministry in Lebanon. And we actually just want to stay in touch with you. We want to be connected with you during this time. So tell us the best way that we can do that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So uh, just prayers, prayers first and foremost. I would covet those deeply. And so I will be sending to Beth a prayer card that hopefully you all can print out if you want and put on your, your uh, fridge or anywhere else. Um, so just prayers would be appreciated over the next few years. Um, I also plan to have a blog. I have a blog. And so I'll be posting just reflections and things I'm learning on that, just kind of processing. Um, I'll also have email updates. So I have in, uh, in mass emails I'll send out every probably month, maybe two months, just updating people, updating you all on, on the different ministries, the different work, what's happening. Uh, and so if you wanna sign up for the blog and the email updates, I will send both of those links to Beth and hopefully she can distribute that to you all if you are interested in following along with, with this adventure the next two years. Absolutely. I will be uh, giving that information out to anybody and everybody who wants it, that wants to stay connected with you. Julia, it has been so good to chat with you, and we just want to pray with you this morning. Uh, we're going to pray uh, before you leave for Lebanon, and we're going to continue to pray for you while you're there. So let's pray together. God, I thank you so much for Julia. God, I thank you for uh, God bringing her to King's Grant as, as a kid. God, and uh, we are so thankful for the ways that we were able to watch her grow up and for the ways that we were able to see uh, your calling played out in her life. God, I do pray for her as she's preparing uh, to leave for Lebanon. God, I pray that you would prepare her spiritually. But God, we also uh, pray that you would prepare the way for her for her departure date. God, we pray uh, for safety with that, with that these travel bans would be lifted at the appropriate time, God, and that there would be safety in her travel, but God, also safety while she's on mission. Uh, God, we pray for a fruitful ministry. We thank you for these types of ministries who are um, God, loving refugees, and we thank you so much for this organization that Julia's going to be serving with. And um, we do pray for these refugees, God. We pray for their safety, but God, we also pray that their hearts would be open to the gospel, God, and that awesome conversations would happen and lives would be changed in Lebanon. Thank you, God, for confirming um, Julia's calling in her life. Thank you for, uh, God, just preparing her for this experience. We pray that you would be with her and speak to her during this time, that you would uh, continue to con uh, confirm this calling, God, and just that she would see you at work, God, and just uh, be in complete awe of you while she's in Lebanon. God, I thank you for for our church family, who's always so generous and willing to support and give. And so, God, we are just so thankful for this partnership. And we pray um, that this partnership would be strengthened, God, that we would stay connected and in, in prayer and in just in communication with Julia while she's, while she's gone. And, God, we can't wait to hear all the things that you're going to be doing during, uh, through this ministry and in Julia's life. God, we love you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Never asked me to stretch out my arms. No one put nails in my hands. I 
I'll never feel the weight of the world Carry that cross on my back Nothing I do could ever repay All that you did on that day about to enter a sacred time because when we get together and do communion, it really is a sacred time, emphasizing you know what our Lord and Savior has done for us. And to begin this time, I'd really like to read some scripture out of the book of Acts. This is in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 42, just to put a little context about where we are in the midst of this crisis, but also where we are physically in, uh, in our community of faith. And so this is uh, chapter two of Acts, beginning at verse 42. They were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Reverential awe came over everyone and many wonders and miraculous signs came about by the apostles. All who believed were together and held everything in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and distributing the proceeds to everyone as anyone had need. Every day they continued to gather together by common consent in the temple courts, breaking bread from house to house, sharing their food with glad and humble hearts, praising God 
and having the goodwill of all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number every day those who were being saved. And so I look at this and realize that they were meeting in the temple and they were getting together corporately, but they met from house to house. And so that's likely where you are right now, participating in this time of communion together. And so as you are in your house and all of our community of faith are in their houses, I hope that you have the communion elements in front of you because we are going to take a look at what this means as a community of faith that we can take these elements together. Another great passage of scripture that we love to read during this time of communion is taken from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. And so I'm going to begin reading at verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this every time you drink it in remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so we participate in the Lord's Supper because we desire to actually commune with Jesus. That's why we're doing this. And so it's a special time. And so when we think about as we look at what these elements represent and what the ceremony is all about, I just want to remind us of a couple of things that we see in this passage of scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. First off, it's a meal. We see that this is a meal. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And so that was a staple in any Jewish home, just as it is for us. And so it was just something that was just very, very common, nothing elaborate or fancy. And so he took bread. It reminds us that it was a meal. But then it also says, and when he had given thanks, he broke it saying, this is my body in remembrance of me. I focus on the word remembrance because not only is this a meal, it really is a memorial. It is remembrance of what he has done for us. So when we take these elements, we are remembering not only who he is, but what he has done for us. But then not only is it a meal and a memorial, but you think about what he says in verse 25. He says, in the same way, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant. And so he says this cup, because we know that the cup he was holding that night was a cup of the old covenant. It was the Passover. And so he's saying this cup. And so I would say that this really means movement. It's moving from an old covenant to a new covenant. This cup is the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. And then finally, the last verse that I had read, verse 26, it says, for whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes back again. And so we see here that this ceremony is a meal, it is a memorial, it is a movement from old covenant to new covenant, and it's also a message. This is a message. So as you see your family gathered together and your children are watching you as you partake of these elements and as you participate in this as a family, this is a message that you are proclaiming who Jesus is and what he has done for you. And so I'm gonna pray for us right now, just a prayer of confession and preparation. So if you wouldn't mind, just bow your head as we pray together. Uh, Lord Jesus, we thank you for the love and grace that you give to us. We thank you for the salvation that you provide for us. We recognize what you experienced that Passion Week, the, your death on the cross, the sacrifice that you did on the cross, the blood that was shed, the body that was broken. Father, we also recognize the resurrection is to come, but at this moment in the life of Jesus, as he institutes this Lord's Supper, this communion time, he's about to go and to suffer. 
Father, help us to look at our own lives, to recognize our own unworthiness, our own sinfulness. And Father, we right now ask that you will forgive us. We have failed you on a regular basis and we just put ourselves into your hands to help us to see inside of our lives because you pierce us and you can see the deep and the dark places in our lives. And Father, you know us both better and, and, and more than anyone else. And we just pray that you will help us to see those places that need to be confessed and forsaken. Father, forgive us when we have failed you. Forgive us for the deeds that we have done that have been displeasing to you. Forgive us for the thoughts. Forgive us for the actions. Forgive us for the things that we do that are so displeasing to you. We recognize our sinfulness and that we are not perfect. But Father, we pray that you will help us to sin less. And as we come before these elements and partake of these elements together, Father, we are just so grateful for the salvation that you offer. And so as we take these elements, Help us to truly commune with you, even though we are apart from one another. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. And so if you would, get your elements out and prepared. Perhaps they're already poured. Perhaps everything is ready, but I'm going to go ahead and pour my juice. And I've got my bread there as well. So pinch off a piece of the bread. And as you hold this bread, think of the incarnation. Think about what Jesus has done coming to us, but then also going to the cross for us. And so we take this remembering what he did for us. Let's take this together in Jesus' name. And then he took the cup the cup of juice represents the blood that was shed for the forgiveness of sins. And as we take this together, we thank him for his salvation. We thank him for his forgiveness. And we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. So let's take this together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray this was a sweet time for you as it was for us. As we have communion, we recognize that it's not only with our community of faith, but our true communion is with you. And we are so grateful for the opportunity to experience this together. Remind us of how frail life is, but also remind us that going through this life, although it may be hard, we do not go through this life alone. Lord Jesus, we thank you so very much. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, you can't have community without communion with our Lord. And I'm so grateful that we are privileged to come together and celebrate and recognize what he's done for us, his life and his death and his resurrection for, for our life. What an incredible celebration. As we move into the teaching of God's word, let's pray together and ask him to continue to prepare our hearts for what he has for us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your holy word. Thank you for this moment of uh, music, worship, community, celebrating at the Lord's table. And Father, now as your word is open, may it encourage and and restore and guide and correct and lead us to where you would have us to be as your people. Father, for, for everyone leaning in this morning and, and tuning in, uh, Lord, bless them right where they're seated. Bless their home and their family and help us to hear you now and to pray this in Jesus' name. And together we said, amen. Uh, beloved uh, Jesuit priest and brilliant ethicist John Cavanaugh decided that he would visit Mother Teresa in Calcutta, India to assist her in her ministry. While he was there, uh, he was searching for God's answers for how he would live out the rest of his days. And so he asked Mother Teresa, uh, would you pray for me? And of course she said, what would I need to pray for? And he said, pray that I will have clarity. Mother Teresa smiled and said, 
I will not do that. Well, Kav and I responded with a surprise. Why not? Mother Teresa said, because it appears the last thing you have to let go of is clarity. So I'll not pray for that. Well, Kav and I commented that Mother Teresa has always seemed to have had perfect clarity. Well, when he mentioned this, Mother Teresa laughed and said, I have never had clarity, but what I have had is trust. And so I will pray for you, she said, that you will trust God more. Now, isn't that an incredible reminder of where our hearts need to be positioned? Never more than than this moment have many felt the absence of clarity. And sometimes our heart's cry is, God, make it clear what you want me to do. Make it clear what you're doing. And sometimes that clarity that seems difficult to embrace. Perhaps instead what we should be seeking is a renewed trust and a renewed faith in God and in Jesus Christ. So we come to this question. In the midst of a crisis, what does faith in God say? That question draws us in to a crisis narrative found in the scripture, particularly John chapter 11. Uh, This narrative builds upon a crisis in the life of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Uh, These sisters witness their brother Lazarus becoming ill and dying. And now they're in this midst of a crisis where, on one hand, they believe in Jesus, not just uh, some cerebral knowledge of Jesus. They truly believe in Christ. And yet, on the other side of their perspective is the death of their brother and the fact that they were confused at, at how Jesus responded after the brother had died. And so we see what many have called this crisis of trust. And and maybe for you, even in this moment, you feel as if you're in a crisis of, of trust. Well, if that's where you are, certainly listen as God speaks through this incredible story in John 11 of Lazarus' sickness and death, but more importantly, Lazarus' resurrection as Jesus called him from the grave. Now, we've looked at this question in the midst of a crisis, what does faith say? And we found one answer to that question in John chapter 11, verse 4, when Jesus said, oh, this sickness of Lazarus is not unto death, but so that God is glorified and the Son of God is glorified. And we discovered that the answer is the promises of Jesus are never limited by our present situation. But we also found a second answer to that question, what does faith say in a moment of crisis? The second answer is found in verse 15 of John 11, where after Jesus delayed in responding to uh, the the message that Lazarus was sick, uh, Jesus then said to those disciples close to him, uh, I am glad for your sake that I was not there, meaning during his sickness, so that you could believe. So the answer we, we learn from that, that episode of this story is trust Jesus even when life doesn't make sense. Now we come to the third answer as the story of Lazarus concludes. The question, in the midst of a crisis, what does faith in God say? And the answer is this, the compassion of Jesus will guide you through the crisis to life. The compassion of Jesus will guide you through the crisis to life. What an incredible answer. What a statement that faith says in the midst of a crisis. Beloved pastor and theologian from a century ago, G. Campbell Morgan wrote this, your response to the crisis depends upon whether you see your difficulties in the light of God or whether you see God in the shadow of your difficulties. Oh, dear friend, I pray that you will not take your faith perspective and put it under the shadow of this present moment. I pray that you will see this present moment in the the glorious light of God. Uh, For us to make certain that that is our objective of faith. 
we need to see inside this final episode of the story of Lazarus a movement from the moment to the miracle. And the only way that that movement can take place in our lives is through our relationship with Jesus. Yes, many see the narrative of Lazarus' death and resurrection as just a historical account that finally reveals the power of Christ. And that is indeed true. But inside this story, we have seen the struggle of of good people of faith uh, looking at the truth of Christ, but looking at their present moment and not able to reconcile the two. With This crisis of trust is is laid to rest and, and ends when we allow the compassion of Jesus to take us from the moment to the miracle through the relationship. So I'd like to look at those three pieces of the final episode of this story with you. The moment, the relationship, and then the miracle. And there'll be two facts we'll glean from each of these different uh, expressions of, of the closing of this story. So let's begin with the moment. As we look inside John 11 to verse 25 and 26, Jesus said to her, meaning to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then Jesus asked Martha, do you believe this? And I would like to ask you that same question. Do you believe this truth? Now, in the moment... Here's the first fact I want to show you that will help you to move from the moment through the relationship to the miracle. The first fact that we can understand from the moment is this. There is always an absolute over the circumstance. Isn't this exciting? There's always an absolute over the circumstance. Jesus revealed in this incredible I am statement, I am the resurrection and the life, to Martha, who had significant questions about Jesus' timing and how how his brother could have been saved, perhaps, had Jesus come early. But Jesus said, oh, Martha, no, he will rise again. And so Martha, in her mind, went to a a foreshadowing of the end of times, where where, uh, the the dead will be raised, a a strong uh, pharisaical belief that was very strong in the Jewish culture. And so Martha agreed with Jesus, yes, one day, In the future, Lazarus will be raised again. But Jesus, in essence, said to Martha, no, right now, at this very moment, in your present circumstance, I am the resurrection and the life. And so there is always an absolute over our present moment and our present circumstances if we'll but trust Jesus. Oh, and look at the absolute that was over Lazarus' sickness and death. It's the I am statement of Jesus. I'm the resurrection and the life. Oh, what an incredible statement. Now, look at this for just a moment from verse 25 and 26. The foundational truth of Jesus, I'm the resurrection and the life, advances two thoughts. The first thought advanced is this. The one who believes in me will live, meaning spiritual life, even if he dies, physical life. So the first thought advanced from this I am statement is spiritual life is always Stronger than physical life. If you live, meaning the abundant eternal life, uh, then then you will you will uh, have this eternal life even if you die. But look at the second thought that the I am statement of Jesus advances, which is the the pinnacle proclamation that should encourage you and me. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never really die. Is that not an amazing absolute? Not only over Martha's present moment, but over ours as well. That regardless of what may come, Jesus is life and nothing in this world will ever take away that spiritual, eternal, abundant life. There is always an absolute over the circumstance. And that was the announcement Jesus made to Martha. And Jesus asked her, Martha, do you believe this? And she said, yes, Lord, I believe. And now in the story, the the scene shifts to Mary. Martha moves and and finds Mary. And and, and I love how Martha secretly whispers to, to Mary, 
Jesus is here. Now, Jesus is just on the outskirts of Bethany, about to come in to the home of Martha and Mary and Lazarus. And, and, and the setting inside the home is a bereaved setting. Mourners from Jerusalem have walked the two miles, and they have circled around Mary. Particularly, the, the mourners are endeared to Mary. We're not sure why they did not express physical endearment to Martha, because when Martha got up to leave, they remained with Mary. But when Mary stood at Martha's beckoning to go meet Jesus, well, the, the mourners followed. So there was an endearing circle of, of grief around Mary as she approached Jesus. You see this in verse 31. The Jews who were with her mourning and consoling her got up when Mary got up, and they followed her as she went out to meet Jesus. They thought she was going to the tomb in proper uh, mourning, but, but she went to Jesus. Now, let's pause here for a second fact out of the moment. A second fact is this. It is futile to take upon ourselves the emotional doubt of a fallen culture, as if that were normal for a follower of Jesus. It's futile. It's unnecessary to take upon ourselves the emotional doubt of a fallen culture. Now, that's not what Mary exercised here, but you see the grieving community pressing in around her. Mary goes to Jesus. Sometimes it's difficult to evade, to avoid the, the encroachment of grief and, and doubt and, and, and despair that our culture can bring into us, especially the close circle of acquaintances that we have. Be careful that you not allow those close influences through media, through personal contact, to influence your faith into an emotional doubt that is not common to a true follower of Jesus. And so we see this fact revealed. It's futile to take upon ourselves the emotional doubt of a world that, that, that is broken, yet that influence is constantly there and constantly before our eyes. But, but be careful careful because in in the moment oh we want to we want to look at something much deeper and, and what a beautiful opportunity we have to take our eyes off of the doubt and to put our, our eyes on Jesus Christ there was a Swiss the Swiss theologian who who made a comment as he appraised Christianity in America and his appraisal uh, stated that he he viewed Christianity in this culture as more uh, broad than deep and more of a mechanism and utilitarianism than, than endearing. Now, I'm not sure of all the basis of his, his response, but, but oh, how, how incredible it would be for us to move past all the breadth and the distractions that can come, even in the form of religion, to our faith, and to go deeper and to find ourselves where Mary found herself, even in the moment of grief, at the feet of Jesus. The, the old saying is, crises and difficulties will, will make you bitter or better. I like the third option. Crises and difficulties can actually take you to the feet of Jesus. And oh, that's where we need to be. So now let's move from the moment to the relationship. And we pick up in the story at verse 32. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and she said, Lord, had you been here, my brother would not have died. Now notice Mary is in the posture of worship, similar to that posture that she will have when she anoints his feet in the, in the subsequent chapter. But, but here at this moment, in this real event, Mary falls at his feet. Notice a, a fact out of the relationship, and I want to share two facts with you from the relationship as we had from the moment. So look at the first fact from the relationship. The burden of the problem should never interrupt your relationship with Jesus. Notice that Mary fell at the feet of Jesus. I love that her posture of desperation matches her posture of worship. So I suggest that although Mary was making supplication, Jesus, where were you? There was still a heart of worship as she bowed at his feet. Her crisis did not give her two options, bitter or better. Her crisis took her to a posture of true, genuine worship at the feet of her master, and the same needs to happen in my life and in, and in your life. So uh, the first fact from the relationship we understand is, is this. The, the burden of the problem should never interrupt our 
relationship with Jesus, Mary fell at his feet and, and embraced and, and began looking unto her, her Savior. Do you see the depth of her love? Not the breadth of, 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 a, of a traditional posture of approaching Jesus. She fell in this deep and resonating dependence and trust she had upon Jesus. Oh, I pray that the burden that you carry right now in this present moment would not interrupt your relationship. And there's a second fact that comes from the relationship we have found in this story and the relationship we have with Jesus. The second fact is this. Jesus always steps into your crisis compassionately. Jesus always steps into your crisis compassionately. As we continue reading, as Mary fell at his feet, Jesus saw her crying, and the other mourners who were with her were there uh, in the same emotional state. And Jesus then asked, oh, where have you put him? But, but in the midst of this inquiry, as Jesus is about to make his way from the outskirts of the village to the actual tomb where Lazarus is buried, we peer inside the heart of our Lord through the scriptures. Don't miss how Jesus stepped into Mary and Martha's life compassionately. Notice the description. Jesus saw her crying, and he was deeply moved. He was deeply moved, and he was troubled, and he wept. Do you see those three expressions of the compassion of our Lord? He was deeply moved. This phrase is interpreted from a, from a term in the, in the scripture that actually indicates a groan, a deep felt pain. And then the word most often translated troubled reflects the meaning of a term in the original text that describe one who gives in to that emotional pain. This is an amazing description of our Lord as he, the God of the universe, fully God, fully incarnate in man, stepped into the life of his friends and, and expressed the, the quintessential picture of empathy as he allowed himself to be deeply troubled with the situation of Mary and Martha. He was moved and he wept, deeply disturbed, the groan, troubled, allowing himself to be affected by the circumstance, and he wept. The term wept actually contrasts the activity of the mourners. The mourners demonstrated that outward expression of grief. The term wept actually indicates something that's very personal. Our Lord cried and hurt for this circumstance. He has compassion for your present moment as well. I can't imagine another incredible encouragement than this that would elevate us from our present moment and difficulties to putting our total faith in Jesus Christ. He has compassion for your moment. He feels and understands what you're journeying through at this present time. And you can trust the Lord who is compassionate for you. Jesus wept. He was moved. And some say he was grieving the loss of his friend Lazarus. That may be. Some say that he was burdened for Mary and Martha who were, who were under the, the bondage of loss and, and death. And that certainly is the case. But also, I think it's interesting that Jesus mourned the, the whole fallenness of the culture that succumbs to sin and death unless he goes to the cross. And Jesus is mourning the brokenness of man, particularly the pain that he sees his dear friends enveloped in at the moment. But he's broken over, over sheep without a shepherd. He's broken over our circumstances. And he, he weeps. He feels for us. He understands, tempted in every way that we are, but perfectly without sin. He knows your predicament right now. And he, he has compassion for you. Oh, this second fact from the relationship, Jesus always steps into our crisis compassionately. Are you leaning on the relationship or are you still stuck in the moment? 
Yes, the moment's tough. We, 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 we see the inevitability of what's around us. We hear the doubt of the, those in a culture crying in grief. But have you moved from the moment to the relationship to see how compassionate our Lord is on your behalf for you? Let's now move to the miracle. I know this is the part of the story you've been waiting on. Uh, I agree. We move now to the final piece of the closing of this story. Jesus comes to the opening of the tomb. We've come from the moment through the relationship to the miracle. And as with the first two in the miracle, we now see two very important facts. Jesus stood at the cave. A direction had been given to to move the stone. Of course, the sisters protested, uh, by now there's decay. And, and because you know, Jews were not involved in the process of embalming, so the, the decay, the, the decomposition was well underway. Jesus said in verse 40, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? They moved the stone. Jesus prayed to the Father. He prayed that all who was there would believe. And then with a loud voice, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And in that moment of quiet, Lazarus walked out, bound with his grave clothes. But he came out of the tomb. Oh, I wish that I could be transported literally to that moment to see the event. Oh, what would it have been like to have seen a dead man walking, not in decomposition, but back to life, fully restored, death and the grave defeated this is an incredible proclamation and demonstration of the power of life that is in our savior and oh what does it take to distract you from trusting in him look at what he did for lazarus look at the power of life that exists in the very son of god because you see when jesus said i'm the resurrection and the life he was not simply stating that he had the power to raise people from the dead which indeed he does <laughs> Here it is in the scripture. But he made that statement, I am the resurrection and the life, to show that he gives eternal life and promised abundant life that can begin the moment you place your faith in Jesus and continue for all eternity. Wow, what an incredible moment. The first fact I gain from, from the miracle is this. The response of Jesus is always far above what we could ever ask or imagine. Now, this reflects the truth we read in Ephesians 3, verse 20, uh, that God would do much more through Christ above what we could ever imagine or ask for. The idea of imagine is anything that we could come up with in our minds. So whatever you could imagine that would take you away from this present moment of your own crisis, whatever you could imagine, God in Christ will do far more than what you've created as a redemptive episode in your own thoughts. He will do far more than what we could ever ask or imagine. Because you see, Mary and Martha, they wanted Jesus there with them. And Jesus said, I'll be with you, but I'm going to give you your brother back. I'm going to restore. But the restoration he offers to you and me goes far beyond the physical grave. Because Lazarus obviously was raised and he would die again in his own mortality. But this miracle reminds us of the ultimate miracle that when our faith is placed in Jesus, we have abundant eternal life. A second fact from the miracle is this. Not only does the response of Jesus go far beyond what we could ever ask or imagine, but the response of Jesus is never just for us. Please hear this. The response of Jesus that moved us from the moment through the relationship to the miracle, his response is never just for us. Because you see, the story was not over in verse 44. Listen to verse 45. Therefore, Many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what Jesus did believed in him. You see, God desires to take you from your moment to a miracle. Uh, the miracle is not something you and I would come up with and claim, but it's what God desires and plans for you and for me. And that can be trusted because he is good. The ultimate God perspective is that God is good. 
and he's good to you. And, and oh, how he desires to move us to that moment where he'll do something miraculous in us. But that moment of miracle will not be just for you. It will be for those around you as well who will see the work of God in you and will be drawn to him. So in this moment, have you ever considered, even inside of your home, that God is desiring to do something unique in you, not only for you to be blessed, but for your children to catch a glimpse of what God through Christ is doing in you? Or perhaps for your wife to see what he's doing in you, men. Or for, for ladies, for your husbands to see what God is doing in you. It's amazing that God will take us from the moment through the relationship to the miracle so that not only will we be blessed, but he will mirror his blessings in us to others so that they might see and believe in him. That is the true miracle. That is the story of Lazarus. And that's the answer to the question in a moment of crisis. What does faith in God say? The answer is, the compassion of Jesus will take you and guide you through the crisis to life abundant and eternal. It's possible that you're sitting there today hearing this message and perhaps you have said to yourself, I've never really confirmed and, and made absolutely certain that my faith is in Jesus. Now, scripture says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God's raised him from the dead. You will be saved. That's his desire for you. Would you confess Jesus is Lord right now? Would you place your faith in Jesus? And would you pray a prayer like this? Dear Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died on the cross for my sin and rose again. And I've put this off too long. Jesus, I place my faith in you once and for all. And I do this right now, trusting your forgiveness of my sin. I repent. I turn to you, and I trust you because of your love for me. Right now, would you pray that prayer? After you pray, there'll be uh, some information that will come up on the screen right in front of me, right in front of you. Uh, the information will be a number that you can text in this uh, digital church that we're blessed to be a part of at this time. And, you can text that number to us, and right now, someone will respond to you. If you'll just text and let us know how you want to know more about what it means to follow Jesus, and if you'll just text to that number the word more, we'll know what's happening and we'll respond immediately. There's also a website location for you to use to, to make other responses of decisions as well. But for this moment... Would you consider what it means to truly place your faith in Jesus? And if you've already made that confirmation in your life and you know Jesus and you're following him, but you've allowed the doubt of a world to get the best of you, oh, right now, would you pray this prayer? Jesus, I'm sorry that I've allowed the present moment to, to weaken my faith. I trust you, Jesus. And I trust you to do something God-sized in my life. Oh, what an incredible prayer that could be. I want to pray with you now. And then after we pray, we're going to rejoin members of our team and have an incredible closing to this beautiful day of worship. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for hearing our prayer. Thank you for teaching us through your word. Thank you for taking us through these facts that guide us from the moment to the miracle through the crisis because of the compassion of your son, Jesus, which is alive and well right now because the grave is empty. And we thank you for that, Father. Guide us from this moment to serve you. We pray this in Jesus' name. And together we said, amen. Hey, love you a lot, community of faith. Look forward to seeing you again soon. God bless. Wow, that was a very powerful message. I really appreciate Ken, all the study that he does, putting these things together. He's really listening to the Holy Spirit and, and reading this scripture and getting out this information that really touches hearts and touches lives. And so when you think about these facts that are gonna take us from the moment to the miracle and that key being a relationship, that really is pretty cool. So uh, I hope that you took notes and that you will be able to uh, review that again. Make sure you go to the class notes. There are other questions to help 
you dive into this passage and to look at Ken's message notes as well. I put some notes at the bottom of that as well. If you need to respond, we would love for you to respond. And so if you want to know more about a relationship with Jesus, what that means, if you want to know more about what it means to, uh, if you have questions about the Bible, whatever it might be, if you want to know more, you can certainly uh, text the word more to our texting number, which is 62488. If you'd like to join the church, you don't have to wait for the doors to be open again. Just let us know if you text the word join to that very same number and uh, we will get in touch with you and, and we'll figure out how to make sure that you can actually join the church during this sheltering in place. But then also, if you have a prayer need, you need somebody to actually pray with you. It's not just filling out a prayer form, but if you need for someone to pray with you, if you text the word pray to that very same number and we have people that will call you back and actually pray with you. So just wanted to let you know about those three ways that you can respond in particular today. So hopefully you'll be able to uh, to really connect and make this a very meaningful experience, even though we can't be in the same room together. Absolutely. Hey, we got something uh, going on that's coming up this week. Yeah, so our farmer's market is back this Thursday, May 7th from 4 to 7. And it does look very different than our farmer's market in the past. And so we're just so glad that we're able to provide this opportunity for our community, but also for our vendors. And so we are going to be doing a drive through market weekly starting this Thursday. And so all of the orders uh, that you would get at the farmer's market, you do need to pre-order. So if you would go to the King's Grant Farmer's Market, market Facebook page. You'll see all the information there. You'll see the vendors that will be at our market. You can place your order with each vendor and then you will drive through and pick up your order anytime between four and seven this Thursday. Please remember that this is a drive through market, not a walk through or a bike through, but a drive through. And so we're just going to do everything that we can to keep everybody as safe as possible. But we're looking forward to actually seeing people. We're excited to, to do that this week. But uh, please check out that farmer's market page uh, for all the information. We're going to try to upload our um, website with some with some information as well. We'll put that out on the Facebook page this week as we get information coming in. But we can't wait to see you this Thursday. That's right. A lot of cool things happening. That's just one of the main things since that is the kickoff for the market. And we just want you to know about that and be a part of that. So uh, we have missed our market since last year. Yeah. And so uh, we were wondering what was going to happen with it. And this looks like it, the direction we're going, this drive through. <laughs> so just remember, it's drive through only, pre-orders, can't go shopping, and you can't just walk in, drive your bike, yeah. any of that. Yeah. So uh, anyway, real, real cool stuff. Well, lots of things are going on this week. Look for opportunities to serve one another. Look for opportunities to pray with one another and for one another. Mm -hmm. And we're just going to continue to be the community of faith. And so we want to thank you for being a part of our worship experience today. And I'm going to pray us out and then uh, make sure you stay tuned for just a few minutes and you'll see some uh, slides of announcements so you can see what's going on and how to get more information. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you so very much for the time that we've had today, the powerful message, the wonderful music, just the way that we've shared communion together. Father, we are so grateful for this community of faith. We just ask that, that not only will you bless us as we go through this life seemingly alone, we, are, we totally recognize that you go through life with us. Father, we pray that what we did here today was a blessing to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good day. Have a great week.